And thank you everyone for uh, joining in um, and being interested in this topic. Uh, certainly as we go through this, um, I certainly welcome your interactions and your discussions. If something's not clear, please chime in and hopefully we can make it an effective session for everyone. So what we're gonna be looking at today is, you know, what is a software bill of materials? So um, the easiest analogy that seems to work for most people is, it's effectively the ingredient list. Um, and when you have things that have ingredient lists like that, uh, you might look at something like a Twinkies and think, oh, that's going to be fine. That's going to be vegetarian. I can use it. Well, there might be beef fat in there. Um, and software bill materials are sort of doing the same sort of thing for the software that you're running on your systems, as well as what you might be wanting to use and import into systems to make products from. So we've got, you know, different modes of working. and looking at how we can actually sort of summarize this information in an effective way so we can automate it is part of the challenge right now. Another way to think about the software build materials is like when you get a kit from Ikea or wherever, um, there's a you know, view of what's actually in it and how you actually put it all together. This is another type of build materials and we're again looking at what a software version is. So we've got three perspectives across the supply chain. We've got the perspective of those who are producing software. This is sometimes referred to as the supplier or the upstream. There's a point of view of the people who are actually choosing which software they want to you know, incorporate or use. Um, and so it's a consumer downstream is the other term that gets used with this. And then there's a the perspective of those who just want to use it. Um, you know, it's in an organization, it's you know, in your own laptop, things like that. Um, and so the perspective of those who are operating. Um, and so each of those has a perspective on what an SBOM is. And so I just want to make sure that we're all sort of aware of that right now, uh, because it does play a role. And the challenge right now um, we have is an open question, you know, how many organizations can actually answer, you know, are they affected by the vulnerabilities? We've been hearing a lot about this on the news. And um, having an accurate software bill of materials for the software on your systems, um, lets you answer that a lot quicker than a lot of manual digging and you know look, looking up and assessing. But the automation generally isn't here and so you're seeing large costs to remediate and things like that that are happening. So what we're trying to do by getting this automation in place is make it much easier to actually just detect um, that you might be affected and then also some it helps with some of the um, basically knowing whether or not you might be vulnerable to certain types of supply chain attacks as well. If you can see that you've got an impact, you know, effective component and you've got the hashing and so forth, some of these things help you remediate and find, you know, detect to remediate more than anything else. So, you know, we've all been hearing a lot about, um, you know, the um, SolarWinds one and then there was Amnesia 33 in the last couple months. The thing is, that you know, a cost to the developers to fix an issue is pretty small. However, the cost to users suddenly becomes very large. So we're seeing a lot more awareness show up. Um, you know, some headlines are starting to show say as much. It's going to be cost be 100 billion to deal with um, all the fallout from the uh, supply chain attack from solar winds. And um, you know, the Omnesia one is like for IoT devices, and you know, it's not always clear. You know, you know, there's you know, there's millions of them out there that may be impacted and then how to remediate. So figuring out how to make things more dependable in future is obviously going to be something we're all going to be caring more about. And part of making things, um, the systems be dependable is actually knowing what's in the systems. You'd think it'd be obvious, but uh, we've evolved so fast in this area that it is a challenge for us all. And the other aspect that's happening here too is, you know, it's not just, you know, time and money. It's actually some of those people's lives in the sense that, you know, when this, some of these software and some of these systems are in hospitals and they're hacked. Um, and you know, people don't know that they have an impacted component. It could mean a design or service or you, know, you can't use certain devices and that could mean someone's life. So it's starting to get into the safety realm too, that we really wanna make sure that we have a very accurate picture of what's going on and how we can be effective. The thing is we have not really been um, focusing on that. We've been mostly focusing on features. Um, and, you know, right now, 99% of the code bases um, were made with, with open source components. Um, this is from Black Duck's report last year. And, so, oh, and they 
from their estimates and their scans and everything, 70% of the audited code bases were open source components. So open source is there and the features are there and you know people are wanting to use those features because it provides the functionality they want and makes you know interesting things happen. But getting it so that we actually have an accurate picture of what's happening through you know dependencies and what's called what and you know how all these pieces hook together. Um, there's a lot of components out there and those components let you do a lot of really interesting things. The challenge though is knowing what's actually in the container or you know what's in the instance you've basically installed to do a function. Um, and we don't really have an easy way right now just to sort of, or a systemic way. Um, there's ways to do it, but we don't have a systemic way of making it just as easy as transparent as like, okay, I'm gonna load down this, you know, software. Okay, what's the software bill of materials? Anything that I might, you know, check for as concern points before I run it. And it's not just at individual level, it's at the company levels too. Um, the XKCD cartoon that came out at the end of last year was just so perfect because we've got a lot of really interesting infrastructure and that's very powerful out there, but there are pieces um, that there's dependencies buried in there that people just don't have the awareness of. And being able to sort of have a way of seeing that, that transparently um, such that when you hear that there's an issue you, and you know you've got a dependency, you can actually find out quickly, am I impacted or not? That's what's sort of missing right now. So this is just to give you a bit of a context as to a why we care about software build materials. Um, the other challenge that's out there is that uh, there wasn't really a good definition of software build of materials. Everyone sort of intuitively knew what they think they wanted it, but there was, no one was really codifying it. And so a couple of years ago, the NTIA um, took on the challenge to try to get a multi-stakeholder group together and figure out, okay, what is minimum viable? What is really a software bill of materials? And they're coming at this from the security perspective mostly, but you know, a lot of the issues have been here and there's been software bill of materials that have been important from the licensing use cases as well. Because you know, in order to run um, open source, you need to know what the license is and you need to be able to adhere to the terms of the license um, in your usage. So there was a lot of stuff already there in place from licensing and getting the, that aspect of built integrated and moving it forward um, has been part of the challenge that we've been working towards. So uh, a software bill of materials is, can be including libraries, modules, open source, proprietary, free or paid. It's anything you're running on a system, we should be able to represent effectively and um, be able to query it. And so if you're curious about this type of information, I encourage you to check out NTI's um, SBOM site and there's more links in here too, and there's a fact about these types of things as well. But um, this group basically sat down and after many months of debate, uh, worked on coming up with a minimum viable. So this is, you know, uh, there was a group called the Framing Group um, in Framing Component Transparency. And so they sort of use this as a simple little reference example about, you know, okay, you've got your application and hey, it's um, including a buffer from Bingo and it's including a browser from Bob and Bob's browser is including a uh, compression engine. And so, um, you know, do we have, you know, do you know everything that's here? Do you know the known unknowns? Um, can you be definitive about, you know, what's actually there, what's not there, things like that. And those were the aspects that they honed in on as being able to define what a software build material should contain. It doesn't say anything about vulnerabilities, doesn't say anything about licensing, it's just, components in the relationships. And from there, we can add and layer on additional information to help different use cases in solving these. But at the heart of it, it's something very simple like this. Now, there's use cases pretty much in the industry for software bill of materials to be pretty much used anywhere within a software lifecycle. Um, you know, you, can, you may want to, before you bring in um, a piece of software, understand what it is. And so you, you, you want to inc include some open source components to provide some functionality in the application you're creating. Um, being able to see what the software build materials is and the dependencies and the licensing and importing it, that might be done before you even start developing it. Um, you know, as you build it, you might want to generate it automatically so that you have a definitive source which says that when you go and release it or, hey, you've got, um, you've done some testing, you may want to, you know, augment it with the results and certifications and so forth. So, and then when you're shipping it, 
someone may asking you for the software bill of materials. So pretty much anywhere in the life cycle, we want to be able to set up the ecosystem so we can generate these things. And that's going to take some tooling. Kate, um, yeah. we have a uh, question uh, sure. uh, to raise a hand. Uh, William, would you like to unmute yourself and then ask a question? Uh, guess not. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll keep going. Just like okay, keep going. Yeah. I'll, um, so, um, you know, why are you hearing about this now? Why should you care now? That's all those people want. I think I'm um, hopefully some of the slides I gave at the start sort of gave a bit of a context. It's basically because our lack of transparency and our lack of automation is starting to cost real significant money. <laughs> And the cybersecurity aspects can potentially now start to impact people's lives. And so we really need to, um, you know, none of us are working on software that if it gets a, has a bug in it, that we want to, you know, think that it potentially could, you know, cause someone to lose their life. And at the end of the day, software vulnerabilities are just bugs. <laughs> so uh, we really do need, you know, bugs happen and we want to fix them as early as possible. Um, but, you know, when a component is shipped, um, and there's a bug that's discovered after the fact, uh, you need to know that there's a bug is there so you can fix it and then you can deploy fixes into the field. And having that transparency is what's been missing in the industry right now. So, um, you know, these things have moved very fast. Um, the ecosystem has evolved tremendously in the last five years. Um, we're seeing more and more reuse happening. It's all time to market from people's perspectives. You know, the startups coming up, oh, we pull all these pieces together, we can go to market with our concept. Um, you know, we also seeing people using containers, the whole Kubernetes, um, infrastructure has exploded and, uh, we've got, you know, a lot of functionality that's much more accessible to people than it was before. And, you know, it's easy to sort of, you know, set up a container that contains your application and let people just go and work and run it. And, um, that's very powerful. So. But what's in those containers and you know what are those containers loading and you know do we have the transparency to know are we making ourselves vulnerable by using it or not and some of that's missing right now so there's people working on that and we're also seeing some of the regulatory um authorities now starting to wake up to the fact that hmm, <laughs> oh, we, we, we do need to know what's going aware um, with the cybersecurity supply chain threats so uh awareness started growing a couple of years ago with the fda and they're letting the ntia effort for um, sort of define what the industry wants. Um, they've given some guidance in that, in the sense that, um, you know, they're expecting to, in future to be able to know what the software bill of materials is that's coming in with the devices. Uh, they haven't put a date on it or any, you know, specific wording, but um, they've signaled and joined meetings and indicated that it's important. The other thing though is like the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Committee has also signaled that uh, we want to kind of know what's near the new software before we put it on the grids, please. <laughs> um, and so getting these types of things, and we're seeing more signals happening um, in the legislation in Europe as well with the NISA and the IoT cybersecurity framework and so forth. So. Um, Hi, K Kate. Yeah, yeah, we actually have a question um, from Ann Joseph. Anne, if you want to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask the question, that'd be great. Good morning. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I really appreciate it. I wish I can actually sit down and have a a one on one. But my main question uh, yeah. for now is, since we're talking about fixes, we all know in our industry, P fixes is like a major. Um, issue do you think the p fixes is, is is mainly because of software because i'm finding that um because i compare comparing to you i'm a novice <laughs> well actually um, i'm going to ask you because when you see the term p fixes can you expand the p please for me um when i say p fixes um i would say probably problem fixes it could okay. be like a software <laughs> or a hardware yep. fix all good no that's fine i just yeah any type of fix that you need to apply to a system yeah, and I'm finding that, because um, I'm new, um, uh -huh. I'm finding that we do a lot of patch fixes when yeah. we do our releases, and I'm realizing that it's because of the, it's 
it's not really the software. I, I think the hardware is not keep, keep keeping up with the software capabilities. Do you think there's a way that we can leverage it? Like, you know how we have expiration dates for, for um, food? Yep. Should we have like an expiration date for um, components a, a, of a server or a mainframe? This is actually a very active area of discussion um, in extending the uh, formats that are being used for representing this information. In fact, there's a group working in Japan that's sort of centered around the automotive industry and they want to have something like usage. Um, so like what sort of, you know, when can you use this and up till when and what for what purpose and have that information carried with the software as well as just the component and the relationships. So there's people that are wanting to sort of get to that stage of carrying that and standardizing on some of that information. The idea being, hey, you're allowed to use this software while you're testing things out, but you can't take it to production. Or hey, you know, we're only going to warrant this until the end of the long-term support period, which is like two years from now. Um, Right now, you have to do manual sort of scrolling through to check and find that, some of that information for some of the open source pieces. Um, and, you know, some of it's written in contracts when it's commercial. Uh, but uh, I think we're going to go there. I think right now, this sort of stuff is we still need to crawl <laughs> as an industry here uh, and get to the stage where we start having this automation happening automatically, you know, in, in parts. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hopefully sure. we can talk one-on-one -on -one, because I love your knowledge and I can learn so much from you. Thank you. Sure, happy to. Okay, um, we have another question in okay, the question go. and answer box. Um, what are the differences between the software bomb in the context of security and licensing from Martha? Okay, so um, when we're talking a software build materials, um, there's sort of two main use cases that seem to be um, used for it and they, they have, that have come from the two different spaces. For, so when you're looking at source code and you're looking at the software build materials for it, that tends to be a summarization of the licensing um, that's sitting in the source so that you have an accurate picture of what you might be pull, pulling in for obligations if you use it. Once you've compiled that or built that source, um, then the, some of those files may have fallen away and their licensing may not be significant. So you may have a different image that has only one license then or, or two licenses from that whole plethora. And you may also quite frankly statically compile in um, some libraries that have their own licenses. And so the licensing at that point in time um, may change based on you know whether you're bringing in something like with a um, reciprocal license or, you know, something like bringing in the GPL as, as a statically link would potentially change the overall licensing of your built image, for instance, as a property of the license of that library. Um, and so there's a lot of different scenarios and nuances. So there's uses for both of them. Um, having a very accurate picture of the dependencies and which actual components are being brought in from a built image is uh, key for understanding it's a lot of the cybersecurity aspects. Um, the licensing ones, it's sort of like more focusing around the sources and then the linkage uh, to the image and the cybersecurity tends to focus on the, you know, the linkage as well, all the way down. That's kind of how I keep it in my head at this point. Does that help? Okay, I'll, try, I'll keep going anyhow <laughs> and move beyond this. Um, just wanted to sort of, um, catch through that uh, supply chain, like say, we're, we've, seen, we've seen the implications of the funding and we're also seeing that, you know, Europe is, as well as the US is starting to look at, you know, starting to standardize on um, build materials. And, you know, we have the, this is the from NERC's um, SIP document, which is, you know, we need to understand what's in there. And so, Pretty much who should be using an SBOM is um, any organization <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that's you know, wanting to make sure that they're supporting their customers effectively and, and quite frankly, being efficient themselves. The challenge is you know, we've got to prime the pump here and we have to get it to the stage where a lot of this is, we have tooling, we have it available 
Um, there's a lot of commercial options out there right now, but that doesn't scale to open source. And see earlier comments that most of this stuff is coming in from open source. Like, you know, that 70% that of the code of products is open source. So that's a gap. Um, so we need to make sure that the tooling is available in open source so that the open source projects um, have, have an easier time keeping an eye on their licensing and can summarize when they put releases out pretty easily. And, you know, any product, be it a product or project, I should say, um, you know, may want to have this available. And, you know, when, you're, when a project is using a dependency uh, from someone else, you know, you want to know potentially if it's got a vulnerability or if it's outdated or it needs to be updated. So there's a lot of rationale that needs to come in here. And as we started talking from earlier, these are sort of like some of the use cases, you know, when you're producing the software, obviously vulnerability monitoring is key um, for your dependencies and working on your code base and, you know, only including what you really need um, when you're operating software, again, vulnerability management, but, um, you know, real-time data, what's happening. Um, and when you're sort of choosing software and you're bringing things in to create into your products, you know, all of these are the cases that we uh, can use having a software bill of materials accessible to us um, and, you know, readable and deployable. Uh, one of the other things too is as we start getting this being adopted throughout the industry in a wider fashion, um, we need to have the processes in place. And so um, the Open Chain um, project, um, which is now an ISO standard, has been calling for a bill of materials all the way along. And the companies that have um, self-certified should be able to generate them for you um, for their products. And so that catches a good part of the supply chain. And once they bring something in, if it doesn't have a bill of materials, they have to generate the bill of materials for the pieces that they're using too. So it's, you know, they're responsible for what we need to be looking at um, or at least be able to access it or say what they don't know. It's probably the best way of saying it. It's like being, being explicit about what they understand and what they know and what they don't know um, and having the processes in place to quite frankly, you know, to work with these types of bill of materials. Um, and, you know, getting that, it's been a, you know, a couple year journey, just getting it so that we have some of these large companies able to work with this. And at the end of the day, um, having these software building materials in play um, just sort of makes financial sense. Um, you know, there was a quote that was made last year that you now we're talking about 100,000 man hours would have been saved if they'd had access to this stuff in terms of um, when dealing with a couple of the vulnerabilities. So what does software bill of materials look like today? Um, well, it can be anything um, from a spreadsheet to a um, file in one of the formats to um, you know, a PDF to um, text in an email. Um, you know, everyone seems to have their own version of things and this is what we wanna try to see if we can standardize on a little bit. Uh, this is an example here and it's got the key elements, but you know, this isn't something we can take and automate. You know, it's got, um, you know, these are the license, you know, these are what's included under this. Here's what the licensing is. And, you know, here's some of the versioning that's in there as well. So there's, you know, there's things in there. The challenge though is everyone doing things in a different form means we don't, can't automate and we can't go to scale. So from the NTIA discussions, um, a minimum viable SBOM um, should contain pretty much a supplier name, i.e. who's produced it, who's, and then what the component actually is um, in some sort of uh, name, generic namespace. Um, there should be some way of uniquely identifying that specific component, um, be it a version number um, uh, or quite frankly, a hash or some sort of global namespace with a relative index. There's multiple ways of doing it. It doesn't need to be prescriptive that you can only do it one way. And realistically, we don't want to do it only one way. But we need some way of understanding that if you're referring to a component, there's a unique way of referring to it, be it a package URL, be it a CPE, something that's, you know, that is definitive within a namespace. And obviously for the component, you want to know what its version is. And uh, to improve the reliability here, because people aren't great about after they applied patches, updating version numbers and things like that, you really do want to have a hash 
So you can say, yes, I'm talking about this, and I really mean this of some sort on that component. And then um, from those compon that component, you want to potentially have relationships um, because it has dependencies on other components uh, included in it, or it has, you know, interactions. And so being able to sort of at least go down one level at a minimum, hopefully more, um, is kind of needed in terms of being able to be a, um, get this automation going. And then obviously the person who created the SBOM needs to be identified, person or company, whatever, uh, who created the SBOM or tool for that matter, um, needs to be identified and that's for building the trust. So if, you know, uh, third, so basically if a maintainer from a project uh, created the SBOM to go along with the release um, as part of the release process, that would have a higher degree of trust in my mind personally than um, if a third party tool was sitting there scanning it and trying to figure it out. Um, or when you've got generating an artifact out of a build, getting that accurate, um, I probably would trust what's coming out of the build as the first thing rather than someone taking and doing a binary analysis on a binary. Um, you know, it's just a question of understanding who's created it and then why, uh, you know, what level of knowledge do they potentially have an authority over the information. But at the heart of it, it's really just these elements and then being able to sort of say, do I have unknown knowns or known unknowns, I should say. <laughs> um, and if we've got the unknown knowns um, and known unknowns, we've got being able to signal that in some way, you know, is a set complete of the dependencies is what we're looking for. If we have another question from sure. uh, uh, Julie, uh, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Uh Yes, this is Julie Cub from NTIA um, ITS in Boulder. And I was wondering about the uh, code signing of binaries in terms of the, um, the SBOM. So I noticed that it has all the items in your list, but what we've recently implemented is code signing of binaries so that if somebody changes our code, we'll mm -hmm. know that it's not our our original or our latest uh, deploy. Yeah, the hash function is meant to sort of capture that type of thing, be it a hash or a signing, some way of basically authenticating it. There's also the signing of what's been given to you and the trust points um, between. And some of that is beyond what I'm talking about is minimum viable here. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot more that can be done. Um, what I'm trying to sort of distill down is the means of the minimum elements. And so if you've got signing on your binaries, um, I'm assuming when you're saying the signing, you're saying, okay, this is a person that's at some element of who's given it to me and what it was like, what it was like at that point in time. Is that correct? Yeah, there's some, I, I haven't, I'm, I'm the software engineering division chief, so I haven't done it myself, but we now have a, a, an ability, a tool mm -hmm. to code sign our binaries. Um, and then when people download it, they know if our executable was what we originally um, deployed. Release. Yeah, or and yeah. That, that, that mechanism, people have been using hashes for that as well, um, for knowing whether it's matching. And like, you know, when you're getting some distros, like you're getting an OS distro, they will have things, all, all the elements in there potentially signed and they'll have their final images signed and then have them available in that way. Uh, so, the signing is a key element of uh, this. It's just a question of the mechanism for doing the signing and the checks. But the key is to have some sort of independent check on the image that hasn't changed. And the version number is not sufficient, <laughs> which I think you found. So we'll sort of going from there. So um, let me sort of keep going on and we can come back to that at the end if you'd like to talk more about that. So right now there's um, a variety of current uh, software building material formats out there. Um, so I've been involved um, on the SPDX one for about 10 years now. So that's what I'm, I know best. Um, the NIST has come out with SWID um, and that also can be used to represent this minimum Bible. And then in the last few years, um, the OWASP community has come out with Cyclone DX. And again, it's available to generate you know, through the package managers and through the builds and is able to, again, represent what minimum viable is. So we've got multiple options out there. 
um, that are suitable for um, automation and can potentially be, the key elements can be interchanged between all three of them. Um, the SPDX file format can actually go to spreadsheets, which um, legal departments seem to like to use. Um, but we also have a format that is, um, you know, tag value, which is like a JSON. And we have JSON and RDF and uh, YAML and XML for SPDX. Cyclone DX also has JSON and XML as the most common formats, so it can support them quite well. And um, we have XML for SWID. So all of these elements are there and interchangeable to a lot, certain degree with various tooling that's in play. So when you're talking about what to do for, to represent those minimum viable efforts, um, like I say, this table just basically shows you these are the fields that um, each of the formats recommends you use to fill in the elements with. And so, you know, um, for working with Cyclone, you'd be looking for using the publisher for the supplier name, a name for the component name, and then you know, some unique identifier information and version and so forth and hash. So there's um, ways of doing it in each of them for these minimum elements. And what we wanna to try to do is at least use one of them rather than um, inventing your own is kind of what we're hoping for here. So that there's not just, there, I don't think we'll ever see one, just one way to do it, but I do think that as long as we can keep it consistent and keep it interchangeable between these formats and then build on these formats um, when missing use cases are there or needed or detected, I think we're on a path then at least to automation. Um, and you know, part of the automation means we need tools, um, be it a tool to sign something, be it a tool to um, you know, consume something. So in the discussions that have been going on in the NTIA efforts, um, we've put together a taxonomy of type of tools where we're sort of looking at, you know, are you producing it? Are you consuming it? Are you, are you doing something to transform your build materials? And uh, in the produce, um, it may be tools that are creating it as a part of a build, or it may be a third party tool looking at someone else's source, you know, source repo or, you know, a binary analysis tool to do an anal analysis for, you know, components that are in there. Or it may be a tool that's, um, you know, taking and doing one of the other two and also added, doing some manual editing on the top of it to refine some information that's ambiguous. This tends to be useful in the licensing in particular, um, where there may be ambiguity as to, or an option as to which license may be chosen for a component. And you may want to explicitly assert that you're planning on releasing this combined work under one of those options specifically. So that you can't really do that automatically. Um, so that being some, having some degree of edit on top of some automatic is usually where we're seeing things emerge that are productive. Um, then you may want to begin zooming it into your, you know, be able to look at it. Um, some of these formats are not exactly friendly um, to the human eye and the text stream. And so, um, you know, viewers to look at them, to integrate them in with your system, to do diffs between things, to import it into your database and then you know do policy checks on top of it. These are all types of tooling um, that's potentially useful. And then um, being able to translate from one format to another or from one file type to another file type. Um, these that sort of tooling is needed here because again we've pretty much recognized no one's going to do you know no one one format's going to rule them all. It's all we're going to have multiple formats out there, but we want to make sure we preserve the interoperability. Um, and sometimes you want to make be merge what's happening with an SO, uh, in a software bill of materials with um, other material data. Like you may want to, in your own system, um, merge you know the software bill of materials information with lookups to the MBD and understand which you know what are the vulnerabilities that are known about a piece a component at a point in time. And you might be tracking that internally in your organization. So. You know, and you may or may not need to, you know, release a report on some of that information. Similarly, um, you know, we need to have ways of making it easy to pull these things in in a standard format and have tooling, uh, libraries to say, okay, I want to read, you know, I want to read the Cyclone DX or I want to read this SPDX. Um, getting it so that we have these libraries there and you know that are open and that people can contribute to and find bugs for and tell us about them, all is going to be helpful. I have a question, Kate, um, sure. in the question and answer from Julie yeah. Cobb. Why are 
their three different formats seems to add complexity, especially in the transform area. Yep. Um, because everyone has ideas and you no know, and and like I say, um, this is what we've got right now. Uh, and I'd rather have three than a thousand um, at this point. So um, SPDX basically started on doing this as part of doing software releases and licensing uh, back in 2010, so I guess 11 years ago now. Um, SWID, I think, started in 2009 um, for the first rev and then had a major revision in 2015. And um, so it's there. And it has additional information on the usage. And that's where its strength point is. And then um, the dependency check tools that were coming out of OWASP us to have this internal format of Cyclone DX. And um, they were finding it very useful for tracking um, the built artifacts, especially in some of you know, the dynamic infrastructures. And um, had sort of standardized on that. Um, the Cyclone DX basically you know, adopted some of the licensing information from SPDX. And SPDX is looking at adopting some of the vulnerability tracking stuff from Cyclone. And you know, it's sort of looking at evolving potentially more of the usage information that some of SWID has. So all of these are living projects and are evolving. And I'd love to see them all evolve at least into similar capabilities, but um, I don't think we can, you know, the communities um, have their own interests and their own needs that they're, you know, they're working on and their own areas of expertise. And so I don't think we'll ever get just to one. <laughs> I would like it, but uh, we, we, there was a couple of efforts that we're trying for doing that, but um, you know, there's, it's, it was a bit too frustrating for some people. And there was an effort that we tried that last year. Okay. And I'm afraid I can't quite see the chat while I'm presenting, but um, I'm assuming I can go forward for now. Anyhow, um, these, um, we've got some Google Docs up there right now that um, have been worked on in some of the working groups for each of these communities that list the tools. And there's other nice reviews and we hope to make a, even a prettier version available on this in the NTIA site at some point in time in the near future. But if you're curious about some of these tools, um, this, these documents are there and they're publicly accessible. And if you see a tool that's sort of missing, go feel free to add it. Each of the documents um, you know, has a template, a standard template to be used in it and to talk about whether it's producing, transform, consuming or transforming. So you understand when you see the tool, is it something you might be wanting to look at further? And we talk about like, you know, things like physiology, um, which is an example here. Um, you know, it's got its own website, its own GitHub location. It has, you know, how to go about installing it, how to use it, and you know, which versions of the formats are supported in it. So, um, you know, we've got, We've been trying to sort of classify the tools and it's not just the open source tools, we've also got commercial tools in the list. And so if you see, if you know a tool that's missing, like I say, just please let us know and add it. Um, how we're sort of looking at some of this stuff inside the LF, well, obviously the open chain for the processes um, from the common data format, like for the data formats um, at the LF, we're using SPDX for what we're working with. And then um, we've got some tools, um, projects that are tools projects under the ACT umbrella that are working to um, create workflows and work these things forward. So I'll be spending uh, most of the time talking about the SPDX because that's what I'm most familiar with, but I'm not trying to say anything negative about the other two formats. Um, there's people that can help you on those two. So um, the open chain specification is out there now. It's an ISO standard. So that makes it easier for procurement people to start to specify it. Um, and it pretty much identifies the minimum level of processes. It's about 10 pages. It's not a hard read. Um, you know, you can get it, uh, you can get the um, 2.0 version of it off of the websites. Um, and then, you, or you can get it from ISO directly. And it has been translated into a variety of languages, um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, Italian. So if you're interested in processes behind working with SBOMs, I'd say, you know, what do you need to look at inside your organization? I'd say, take a look there. Um, software package data exchange um, is, can extend well beyond that minimum Bible. It's a lot of use cases it can support that are not part of that, <laughs> but I'm just sort of focusing on the basic SBOM concepts, but it's easily able to represent an SBOM. Um, and it can 
let you exchange more of their, you know, more information in the ecosystem. And so it is, and oh, sorry. Um, yeah. When you get a break, I have another question on the question and answer. Okay. Is it okay? Good timing to take yeah, that question. I'll do go one. for it. I'll okay. the... It's a bit longer question from Joy. Um, okay. Um, Gosh, uh, uh, very interesting approach and tooling solution. How about uh, um, getting 2021 3TS BOM ESPEC into LF in 2021 timeline? So um, the three T. So see earlier comments about trying to get everyone working together. <laughs> um, basically, the three T effort started up its own group, and myself and some of the other SPDX people sat in and in on those discussions as part of trying to get it to all see if we could find one unified solution here. And um, there was. Um, you know, I think we've got certain things that are reconciled. And so the new, ver new version of SPDX, SPDX3, is going to be containing a lot of the 3T, um, I some of the 3T ideas. We've refactoring SPDX3. So we've got 2.2 right now we're working on. And for SPDX3, we've refactored it to just be a core, a basic core, which lines up with sort of what you're seeing here and lines up with some of the stuff that we saw on the... Um, Uh, you know, some of the stuff we sort of seen in the SPDX Lite community. So NTIA had, in parallel with what was happening in NTIA and coming up with this core minimum viable, uh, there was a work group in Japan uh, from OpenChain that started looking at, we wanted to have a minimum set of SPDX and they called it SPDX Lite. And that's actually an appendix in the spec. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in future. But um, the 3T folks were sort of looking at trying to um, come up with a model. Well, SPDX already had a model underneath it. <laughs> and so the question is, okay, well, what can't you represent and how can we evolve together? So um, there's been many, 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 many hours of long discussions with the 3T and the SPDX community on trying to unify. And the 3T folk are sitting in on the SPDX tech calls now and working on the model in common for the next rev. So it's moving itself forward slowly. Hopefully that answers. I'm sorry, I can't see the chat while I've got the presentation up, but uh, when, we, when we stop presenting it towards a little bit later, I'm happy to get more discussion about that. No other questions, Kate. Okay, thanks. So to the point here, we have an underlying model with SPDX and we've had it for, you know, pretty much since we started. So there is actually a data model that's sitting there and that gives us the power to go to all these formats and to transform back and forth between all these different file formats. And so, and also to validate, quite frankly, that, you know, if someone gives you an SPDX document, you know, is it a valid SPDX document? Well, um, by doing the checks against the model and the framework, um, you can say whether it's valid or not. And similarly, you can go to a spreadsheet between a spreadsheet and a JSON file with the tooling. And so that's been very powerful uh, for us in the SPDX community. And as a result, this is what we're sort of um, sticking with which is making sure we always have, can have an underlying model. And that's one of the things that, you know, OMG obviously cares about. And so, you know, in, we're in, sort of in discussions with, you know, making sure that anything that we evolve to is going to have an underlying model that can be validated. So SPDX today is being used already with various tools as an interchange format. Um, Quartermaster and OSS Review Toolkit both um, can generate SPDX as part of their builds as they're building systems and monitoring things. Um, OSS Review Tool can also generate Cyclone DX. So another format is there um, with that one. And um, we can also have um, tools out there that are also going and doing the analysis of existing images. So in specific, specifically of interest, um, the TURN project is taking and doing analysis of a container and summarizing it. Um, Phosology will take and look at sources and repos and basically let you go through and summarize what the licensing is. So it has the edit aspect associated with it. And it also can go in and input in um, other people's SPDX documents. So you can compare has something changed over time with what you're looking at from a source perspective and what was issued as an SBOM before. And then the project has created tools and libraries for various languages, um, for Java, for Python, and for Go. Um, so you have standard libraries to include into your tools to actually just sort of read and write 
formats and make sure that they're valid and you can transform them. So, you know, we're trying to build up an ecosystem bit by bit by bit, um, as, is are the, as are the other formats. So if you want to know what tools are out there right now, um, that is a little there's a shortened URL document and there's one for each of the other formats in the same tiny CC format if you want to look at the other formats too. Um, but with the SPDX one, here's the ones that are there. So let's actually start getting into the more interest, you know, get into the, okay, what does this really mean when it hits the road? Okay, that initial example that we had, um, oops, sorry, I guess I can't, no, I can't get the chat to come up. Um, anyhow, the initial, initial example um, we had um, earlier um, could have been represented from a draft diagram into something that was just a, a table or a spreadsheet. Um, and have the, some of the key elements. So let's take this example and sort of work it through a little bit more. Okay. One of the, here, now, we, now we'll sort of go up and I can start to see things. One of the tools that's out there right now is um, been contributed in from CERT and they did, they created this to help the NTIA effort and it's stateless. Um, anything you're putting in, you're not, you're not sort of logging, but it's a good way for experimenting. And so the, I've got here the link to it in the slides. And when we bring it up, um, here's a swift, here's what it actually looks like. And what you're doing is you're filling in the key fields um, there and you can add components and it will eventually sort of take and look, you know, generate. So let me just load up, um, let me just import the, I, I filled it in before the, before this to, um, for that example. So let me just bring that in. So here's your Acme application. And what you might want to do then is you've got your component name application, which is your primary. And then you've got saying that this is your primary component. And then you've got Bob's browser. Bob's browser and its version, and you've included it. And it is uh, parents component is primary. And then you've got um, the um, Carol's compression engine <laughs> and its parent is actually the browser. And then we've also got um, the bingo buffer um, that's, you know, related to the application. And actually, um, it's actually a compression engine, now that I see about it. So this is, you know, and so if you go and click on this to generate the SBOM, here's what it looks like in SPDX right now. And so you've got the SPDX information. And this tool will also show you what it would look like in SWID and what it would look like in Cyclone. And they've also got the JSON versions. This tool implements the JSON versions for the SPDX ones. You're gonna to have to go to another tool, but I can show you that in a minute too. And it will show you a graph. So if you wanna start experimenting with the different formats, this tool just lets you sort of start experimenting with the minimum viable and looking at these things. And um, we'll generate a valid SPD, you know, all the valid formats. So when I go back, let's see. This is one of those things where the website is interesting because it doesn't seem to quite go back to that top level, but I'll just close it here. The other thing that's of interest here is um, the SPDX Lite has got a very similar concept um, than the minimum viable does. And it does include here the SPDX Lite fields. And so if you wanted to, you could extend this and uh, fill in the SPDX light fields, which then makes it easier for you to import into systems that already have um, SPDX and are expecting this. And so some of the um, companies have been asking for it. And so this will let you experiment with it, see what it looks like, figure out some next steps, that type of thing. Kate, we have three questions. In oh, wow. Okay, question. let's see. I think I can actually see the chat now too, good. Okay. <laughs> 
So um, the first one is, are there any ideas for the process, how software suppliers transmit the SBOM info to, the cu to customers? Like a fast disclosure portal, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there are some ideas on how to um, convey the information um, to the suppliers. One project that is um, being spun up is something called the Digital Bill of Materials where you can um, share, uh, basically share in a standardized fashion and set up effectively channels and authorizations for public and private. And if that project ends up, you know, gets spun up when we're doing that, one of the things I wanna see come out is for any, there to be a, effectively a channel so that any open source project can log in, you know, what they consider their reference bill materials there. There are conventions out there right now um, for the bill materials and where to put things. Um, and so when you try to go about generating them, like uh, the Free Software Foundation Europe has a site called reuse.software. And for people creating, build, you know, doing software development, they have some guidance. So you can make it easy to generate the software real materials, for instance. Hopefully that helps. Um, next question I'm seeing from John. Um, okay, it's Kate, but not Julie, but anyhow. <laughs> Um, there's no, as there is no current standard for an SBOM, the three separate formats were created by three different organizations. OpenChain and the Linux Foundation, among numerous other groups, are working together to agree on a standard format. Um, well, actually, so the SBOM, you know, the term SBOM is interpreted by a bunch of people. So um, all three formats, what we're trying to at least try to do through the NTI efforts is agree on what it should contain as a minimum viable at least so we can at least start to tackle it and I think we've got some degree of agreement on that and all the formats can represent it so I think it's moving itself forward um, and I think that's going to be as good as we're going to get for a while okay I guess the last question is um, should code snippets also be included in this bump if yeah, there's, there's reasons to it, and some of the formats can support it. Um, specifically, SPDX can support having snippets included if the licensing is different than the base licensing or some piece of code's been imported. So yeah, that use case is very valid and has been represented. Um, and so on the licensing, you know, build materials for licensing is being able to include snippets as component, as in elements related to the files that they're in is something that's already there. Okay, Tim's asking, um, is the DBOM you mentioned the one Unisys is working on? Yeah, the DBOM, Unisys is working on trying to form up um, a consortium uh, with others that are interested in helping to evolve that. So um, Chris Blask is taking the lead on that and happy to connect you if you're interested in learning more. Okay, great. I think we've answered the questions. You know, like I say, this is all the interactive part right now. So feel free to unmute and just ask questions directly too. Oh, can I clarify what I mean by snippets? Um, sure. So what a snippet is, is it is a couple lines of text um, that might have been included from somewhere else. So there's a lot of re repositories out there that say, you know, hey, how do I do this? And someone goes, oh, we'll type these two lines or, you know, here, here's this, here's this little, you know, phrase of Python code. Um, and then someone takes that and cuts that out and puts it into the application they're running. That's a snippet <laughs> um, in the sense that it was probably put up on a different license terms than the types of terms that, you know, they may be releasing their code under. It may be the same, but it may also be different. And so sometimes it's useful to be able to, you know, call those things out. Hopefully that helps. Okay. So what we've also got here, let me go back to the slides and I'll just sort of do it that way, this way here. So as you can sort of see, um, you know, when we actually take and, you know, we're looking at that example, um, not gonna have anything generated, but let's see if this will work. <laughs> With the SP. Yeah. When we start looking at it, we can, we, can, we can basically see the compression, you know, we can see the same graph that the initial diagram was having. And it was a nice feature just to be able to have these graphs and you can download these things and examine them further yourself. Um, the other tools that are out there to play with um, and are useful 
and there's a diagram, yeah, just in case things are not gonna work. Um, the SPDX light, if you hear about that, um, the specifications out there, and it's just a subset of the fields, and those are the fields you saw when you expanded it out. And what it's just defining is a valid SPDX document. It's not like it's not, but these are the fields that um, various people wanna see when they're bringing in products. And so they basically articulated these were uh, the fields that they were looking to see, and some are mandatory and some are optional. They're not all mandatory. And, but um, if you wanna learn more about those, this part of it, um, the SPDX specification is publicly available. And you can you know, go to the appendix on SPDX Lite and it sort of talks about these are the fields. And then if you go into the sections in the spec on the document creation information, it tells you whether something is mandatory or not. So all of this information is hopefully reasonably at your fingertips. And if things are unclear, you know, just chime in on the SPDX tech list. Um, you know, there's people willing to help there. Okay. Yeah. As we're looking through that list of mandatory information, uh -huh. we're beginning to hear laws about uh, bugs must be fixed and issues must be fixed within a certain amount of time. Yeah. That's starting Are we to get... beginning to track that information in here? And can we use this to uh, look it's... at how quickly the nesting? Yeah, no. Um, to be able to fix things in time, you need to be able to discover them in time, right? Um, and so this will help with that. Um, in terms of the terms and usage of, for the software and the you know, terms of service and things like that, that sort of sidecar type of thing, and it's potentially a profile type of thing. Um, there's also a lot of stuff on vulnerability that people want to know. Like another case I'm hearing is um, when you've shipped me this or when I'm taking ownership of this, what were the known vulnerabilities at a point in time? So we're looking at extending um, the specification for show, you know, showing that use case. And I know I think Cycling's got that one already handled. Um, and we're probably looking at pulling something very similar into SPDX in the next release to be able to show that type of thing too. But um, usage in terms of you know, service agreements and things like that, that would be something you might want to convey along uh, with a contract that might go on a DBOM that you really wouldn't want to put into a bill of materials if it's you know, between proprietary. Um, company, you know, between one company and one commercial company and another commercial company, they'll have various terms. And one of the myths that's out there on this, and I'll just say it right now, um, the license that uh, we've put the data in an SPDX file under does not preclude you putting commercial terms around it. And we chose that very carefully with a lot of lawyers <laughs> involved in the discussion uh, about nine years ago for that reason. So if someone says, oh, well, it's CC0 for the SPDX, no, that just means it, it, it is basically, you can share it effectively. Um, it does not mean you, it does not preclude other terms to be applied. <laughs> so I will, I will just bring that point up right now I got the chance because it just seems to come up over and over. We have a couple of questions, Kate, okay, and a sure. question and answer. Thanks. Um, the first one is, why is it called SPDX Lite? It looks like the list is longer than the SPDX SBOM minimal list. Ah, so the list I was showing you wasn't the SBOM, SPDX minimal SBOM, yeah. The, NTI, the list I was showing you for SBOM was the one that NTI agreed on is minimal. And SPDX um, requires a few other fields in order to be a valid file format. And so some of these other fields here are things that the minimum doesn't have, but we think it should. <laughs> Um, specifically, um, knowing when it was created is important. That's not in the minimum viable right now. And so if you want to try to understand, you know, which, which SBOM for this product is the most current, having a date stamp is a really useful thing. Um, the other thing is, too, is our versions of the specification will change over time. Uh, we've evolved, you know, for multiple releases, as you can see. That isn't a minimum viable, but I do think it should be um, because, you know, the specifications, um, you know, Cyclone has evolved, SPDX has evolved, SWID's evolved, all of them have evolved. So being able to know exactly which version of the specification you should interpret the data from is kind of key. Um, and then for uh, SPDX, since we came in from the licensing background, obviously having a data license um, so that you know what you can and cannot do with the data is useful. 
And so then, like I say, the other fields here, let me just go back to that example field. Um, oops. Um, let's see if I can bring it up somehow. Um, there seemed to be another related question, okay, sure. uh, if you want to take that. Okay. Relationships seem to be one of the powerful features on SBDX, but the light version does not include these relationships. Is there a reason to get rid of them in no. light profile? No, actually, it's um, the light profile can use all the relationships that are in SPDX. Um, if, the, if the people working on the light profile are just sort of standardized on, on the level plus one, um, they're certainly welcome to. Um, and the includes profile is there. We use it contains it for includes in SPDX. And so you can certainly, you know, match up with the minimum viable. Um, but it's really useful to know if something is statically linked or dynamically linked. And so being able to uh, work with that and have that type of information, um, I, you know, I kind of like to see that as Cyclone evolves in this direction, that maybe we can collaborate and making sure that we have coherent sets of relationships that we are working to both, both projects they are working towards because they are useful. And like I say, anything get, things that have gotten added to SPDX have been added because someone had a use case and we couldn't solve it with what was there. So um, all the relationships of things that have, people have wanted to be able to represent in the builds or you know, build dependencies of things like that, that are important for understanding what's going on. Um, Okay, thank One you. more question, uh, okay. sorry if that's okay. Should COTS components um, also be included in SBOM? Okay, uh, Vaishali, uh, you want to explain on what you mean by COTS components here? I, I, I'd like, you know, I've got an idea in my head, but I want to double check here. Can you unmute and just sort of chat with me? Can you hear me great? Yes, I can now, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. Actually, I'm an open source license compliance expert. Maybe uh -huh. that's why these questions are coming up from my uh, mind. So no. COTS is commercial off the shelf component, like yep. vendors, we, we buy them from vendors. So yep. should they also be included? And then, um, I mean, I'm working from AMD right now. Uh, advanced micro devices. Yep. So as of now, the S bomb it, it doesn't contain all those things. So uh, the the issue here, we uh, yeah, I mean individually as a company, we have is our products are moving so fast. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say every month there are new versions, new features, and everything. So in that scenario, would you still uh, suggest that S bombs will be useful? Yes. <laughs> Very much so, yes. Um, yes, 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 yes. Um, okay. There's nothing to preclude you representing a commercial product with an S-bomb. And okay. I, um, one of the things that was done in the NTIA effort is uh, they, we had a healthcare group do a proof of concepts of trying to use these minimum viable fields and to see between the medical device manufacturers and the hospitals where they containing, were they able to communicate effectively. And okay. so, um, and there it was all um, things like windows and, you know, um, patches on windows and, you know, subcomponents and things like that. And that was all done on behind NDAs um, just because, um, you know, some of the bill of material information is considered, um, you know, potentially an issue uh, from mm -hmm. device manufacturers. But okay. there's nothing, like I say, that's what I mean. Like you can represent this information in these S-bombs. Um, you know, it's just a matter of coming up with, okay, what's it called? Well, it's Windows, it's called Windows, and it's called this version of Windows. And oh, hey, there's a, uh, you know, a hash or a signature on the image so that you have it to know okay. it has been patched. Um, all of these concepts should be able to be applied to commercial software as well as an off-the-shelf software as well as any open source. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank sure. you, Kate. Sure. Happy, like I say, yeah. happy to get yeah. more questions on how to sort of get these implemented because yeah. Yeah, we like to sort of, you know, get this type of communication yeah. happening throughout all these places. But as you say, it's all moving so fast. We need to figure out how to automate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. And then, like I say, so if you want to play around with the Swift bomb generator, um, I will be putting mm -hmm. the link um, in towards the end of this or probably fairly okay. shortly, actually. Um, and you can sort of play with it. It's, it's stateless so that it, they're not storing it anything on their server. 
And then I think the other tool I just want to sort of show you guys is the SPDX online tools. And here, um, I've got it loaded up already. And what happens here, and this is sort of if someone gives you an SPDX document, this gives you a way of validating it to see it, is it real or not. So um, one of the things I can just do, let me just go grab it, is I downloaded that uh, Acme application. And the one, same one I imported in, and I just opened it, which was actually generated from the tool originally. <laughs> and its um, file type is tag. And so I just want to validate, and it'll just tell me if it's valid or not. So if someone gives you an SPDX document, it's pretty clear, it's pretty straightforward for you to take a look and see if it's validated. This tool will also let you convert it. And so if I wanted to take the same file and let me just bring it in again, and I wanted to take it from tag, and I wanted to take it over to JSON, and that's, you know, called it Acme there. Then it can convert it and I can download it. And there you can sort of see it in JSON. So you can go between the file formats and this is the power of having a model underneath you. As you can go between, you know, what's potentially easier to use in your system. If someone gives you something in, you know, XML, you could probably move it over to JSON and vice versa, depending on what you're using internally. So that tool's out there to play with things. And then there's a lot more, you know, sophisticated tools associated with binary analysis and with, you know, source code scanning and so forth. They're there that you can find from the tools, um, from that tools directory. I guess the other one thing to sort of, you know, um, show is we get lots of questions about how to represent things. And so, um, Steve Winslow, who's part of the SPDX group and is um, also, you know, co-lead for the legal team, um, has been working on pulling together visible examples for everyone to work from. And so we've got these SPDX examples here. And so if you're sort of curious how you might want to represent something, we've got some simple examples showing here what, you know, a basic hello world, what does it look like? And, you know, it's all in one package. What would a bomb look like? You could do it in separate packages, like, and, you know, especially as we start to get into very complex containers, um, you're going to want to partition things into logical portions. And so with the, you know, the SPDX stuff, you can do it. And these are examples you can go off and go in and look at to see, okay, here's how this thing was done. Here's what the build tree looks like. Here's what the files will look like. And it has, you know, a content of um, a source and for binary. You know, so here's what, it would, here's what the SPDX um, would look like for the source for this hello world. And then here's what it would look like for a binary or a built artifact where certain you know, things have been coming forward. So those examples are out there um, to explore and to learn more about. And then um, those are just small ones. And then I guess uh, one of the things we're starting to do here at the Linux Foundation, again, with the view of sharing um, and making it easier for other people to see so some of the large projects at the LF were actually putting out the source S bombs that are sort of scanned. Um, so, you know, basically the LF Energy program, for instance, if you wanted to go and see what the S-bombs look like for some of those projects in there, um, it's there. And this has been produced from Physology's tool with some manual editing on top of it. And I guess this one's two megabytes, so uh, it's pretty big. I probably should have found a smaller one, but as you can see, you can go and click on it and start to look and see what the what the S-bomb would look like for the sources for this when it has been you know, curated to some degree in terms of what's in the file and is there assertions at the higher level and things like that. I think there's a few places in there too that there might even be some snippets for those who are interested, but um, I don't okay, know. If I may, what uh, right are the reasons for curating? Um, why would you want to curate uh, a Why would I generator? want to curate? Yeah. Um, well, you want to curate because um, but sometimes when you're doing the scans, you're finding that you can use a piece of software under the terms of, um, you know, BSD or um, like BSD3 or, you know, Apache 2. There may be that in your license header at the top. And um, 
when you're deciding to take and build it in, you may want to say, I'm, it, you know, explicit license has been chosen, but there's no real way of signaling that as to which are the options of something when there's multiple licenses as being there. So being able to, you know, curate and say, yeah, no, I know that they intended it to be shipped under this license from the overall project's perspective, because that's the one that works with the rest of the pieces of licensing that's there too. Um, that helps people guide people further. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Is is the with, with the ability to update software not just on uh, Windows machines and that type of stuff, but in devices that have been deployed out in the field for years. Uh -huh. Certification yeah. of meeting standards really needs to track the embedded software release rather than the device. Is that certification something that would be found in an SBOM or does it get tracked outside of it? Um, that is an area that we're trying to grow into. So we have standardized ways of tracking what's there. So I think it will need to be in there, um, what certifications are there and what certifications associated with things. However, I don't think any of the formats are catching it right now. So it's an area that if you've got viewpoints and uh, thoughts, feel free to go to like, you know, go onto the SPDX issues and describe the use case so we can make sure we're thinking about it and give some examples and that would help us uh, evolve. But um, a lot of this stuff gets conveyed in other ways too. And it's not possible for automation, but before you deploy, you wanna know what's been certified, what's been tested, things like that. And, you know, uh, establishing it so we have a clearer pass of the evidence and the handoffs of the provenance as well as the pedigree is an area that needs to work in this area in in these S bomb formats. But that's you know those are cases beyond like what I've got here right now is just your basic crawl um, working with S bombs. I think those are some of the run and potentially even you know crawl walk run. I think those are run cases and possibly even flying cases. And I think we'll go there, but we've got to build it up because you know there's different levels of knowledge throughout the industry, and we're going to need that stuff for the vulnerability stuff. No question as well as quite frankly for the, do I need to retest everything for a certification or not on the IoT side, device side. Did that answer the question? Very well, thank you. Okay, <laughs> just checking. Anyone else have any questions? Don't see, oh, um, there is a question that came in. Okay, sure. Uh, in the in the question and answer. Uh, the granularity shown up to now is at the package and module level. What cases do you recommend to go to the file granularity level? Um, so at the source bombs, source code bombs, we, um, I recommend those go to the file level, especially from the build, because uh, right now we're just seeing the components, um, you know, an approximation of the license. And we found from analysis that's been going on on the licensing side anyhow, that um, the licensing at the um, top level doesn't really match reality all the time, uh, what's actually there from the interactions with licenses. Um, I gave a talk on this with Richard Purdy from Yocto um, about three years ago now. And um, we were looking at the Yocto project and seeing how, you know, what, what the coherence is there. And so I know that, that that project, for instance, is very much interested in making sure we start to have, you know, automatically generated SBOMs um, from the Yocto, as well as uh, the reproducibility. So that project is again, focusing on those areas. And then having the information associated with the reproducibility carried in the SBOMs um, is gonna be uh, something that may be needed from the safety certification perspective, because you need to know um, for some of the standards, um, you know, who is, who's built it, were they authorized, what the reputations were, things like that. And being able to track that as part of the SBOM is gonna be useful down the road too especially as we interact with open source. Okay, oops, another question came in on the chat. Um, oh. Yep, oh, that's right, Steve's just reminding us. Um, for, that, uh, for this ex example repo, if you don't know how to do something and you wanna figure out how to do it, like, you know, um, the examples here actually are showing the file level back to the earlier question. Um, but if you've got questions, uh, please just open an issue. Uh, we're looking for things that people don't know how to do so that we can come up with reference examples. 
and so that's there too. So I guess just to sort of wrap this up then, we're getting close. Um, you know, there are benefits for adopting an SBOM and I would encourage you to sort of start taking the steps towards doing it, be it for as a developer to go ahead and make it easy for them to be generated from the code you're working on, like by putting standard licensing in, like, you know, SPX license IDs in the headers or something like that. Um, or, you know, setting things up in your CI CD pipeline such that on your releases, you're generating out an SBOM. Um, or, you know, so as developers, you can do things. And then, you know, as you're bringing things into your organization, you're deciding whether or not you want to use an open source project, go and look for its SBOM or ask for it. And then, you know, when you're creating products, be able to make it available to your customers. So it helps with the licensing and it will help down the road with the vulnerabilities and it will help with the risk quantifications. So, and then I think as we get this whole ecosystem sort of shifted over, um, we'll, we should be starting to see some operational costs getting lowered. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a large lift for the ecosystem, but I think if we can take it bit by bit, piece by piece, over time, things will get more efficient. So with, I guess that, um, there is one question in the chat about API. Do we have any API to make a call from some pipeline? Um, do we have API to make a call from some pipelines? Um, for in terms of what? Um, so like there's various tools that are out there uh, that will generate out and have API interfaces so that they, um, so you can you know incorporate them into your um, CI CD pipelines and generate our SBOMs. Uh, we're sort of, exp we've been doing some experimentation. I think, you know, anything that's got some command line interfaces can work with um, some of these and do the generation. And so some of these tools definitely have um, command line interfaces. Um, and so like scan code will um, let you, for instance, is another tool that's out there that will let you generate out SPDX SBOMs um, when you're doing your builds and like, uh, I think, there are others. And so checking out through the tools and seeing which ones have command line interfaces and which ones you want to plug in. I think the reuse software has a little linter tool that you can plug into your CI CD pipeline and it'll help you again, auto gen out an SBOM from your builds and do the checking that everything is finding its licenses properly too. Okay. So one think... more question from Steve in the question and answer. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, for the SP, is that the SPDX example repo we've got? Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, Kay, uh, how would it benefit uh, an open source project and community to create a SBOMs for their own project releases? That's the question. Oh, how would it? Um, well, Debian has its version of this already and has some degree of compatibility with us. Um, quite frankly, uh, it benefits by being able to keep the discipline on the licensing checks, it means you suddenly keep your code usable. Um, one of the things that starts getting surprising people all the time is when they start actually doing the scans at the source code level. Uh, they find that pieces have been brought in from other projects because it was convenient and it may not be compatible licensing. And it's much easier to find this as you're scanning and as you're building along and fixing it right as you go along rather than when you're trying to do a release or someone's trying to use it and coming back to you after the fact to remediate. So from a licensing perspective, at least, having the scans happening and the bill of materials um, being generated means that, you know, you have a check that you can put into your, your pipeline flow and say, hey, if it's not matching this license, uh, reject and go, re go rework it or go find it and where it's easy to do so. Because the earlier you fix the, you know, see, spot these issues and fix these issues, the, you know, the cheaper we know it is to fix them. So um, we're working on this right now in the Zephyr project and we're using Zephyr as a prototype here. Um, and we're working so that we can eventually get the Zephyr builds to be generating out the SBOMs as well on builds. So every time you're building the IoT device image, uh, we wanna have a file level uh, SBOM available so you know exactly which files are in there. Um, one of the cases that pointed that out we needed this for us was um, Amnesia 33 in that certain st um, software stacks uh, were impacted. And in our LTS on that project, we did use part of one software stack, but we didn't use it at, the, we didn't use the parts that were impacted. And so we had our own code for those parts, but we needed to be down at the file level to understand whether or not vulnerability was appropriate or not within um, the Zephyr release. 
So getting it so that we can develop builds and as people are trying to you know, create very customized images for these builds or for distros, um, having that level of transparency is going to be key. So one last question looks like in the uh, chat. In the actual source code, we have standalone components. What is the most straight way to have information stored in order to generate an SPDX document for the product? Um, so um, the reuse software um, uh, project has worked up guidance on how to start to articulate the licensing and um, some of the reference information that's valid from an IP perspective into your um, source. So tracking the inf key information in the source file with the source file is definitely the preference. And then the tooling will automatically generate out. If you, if you follow the reuse guidelines, you can generate out an SBOM right with their lint tool. And we've taken that information and those guidelines and have applied it to the Linux kernel. So if you look at the Linux kernel, you'll see that we're following the guidelines there of how to, where to put licenses, where to put you know, the identifiers, how to connect everything together. Um, and we're doing that in Zephyr as well. So if, like I say, I encourage you to look at the Linux kernel for what's been happening there. And then you know, there's a whole bunch of other projects that have adopted the license IDs anyhow at this point now, so it's easier. And the more we have the, these adopted, the less sort of guesswork happens as to, is it this license or is it this license variant or is this license variant? I think uh, Philippe Ambradon did, did a study of it and the number of variants that he found with his scanning tools is actually quite disturb, disturbing um, for the same license. And you know, expecting these tools to do effectively AI to try to sort of guess the licenses and you know, still have to fall back on man, you know, someone manually looking at it and making a judgment call making it as quick as we can to automate what the license is, um, I think helps the whole ecosystem. Okay, well, I think that that's it pretty much. And um, thanks again, I guess, for everyone who has um, asked questions and hopefully, um, oops, let me just go to the last slide then. Um, we do have more, information out there. Um, for those who are particularly interested on the licensing side, there is a free course that you can take um, that goes through the basics of it. Um, this one here. Um, and there are there are more, more terms available. So um, open source you know, licensing basics for software developers will tell you how to go about creating the SPDX IDs and putting them into the files, as well as the other ways of you know, catching it so that tooling can start to recommend, you know, recognize this stuff and give you a bit of an orientation about some of the licenses as well. So if you get a chance um, and you wanna learn more about that, just take the course, it's about an hour, an hour and a half course. It's not too long, but it does give you some of the basics. So some of this stuff makes a little bit more sense. And then we do have some other resources. So I'll just say thank you very much for joining us today and turn it back over to um, our host. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. And thank you, Shua, for all of your help as well. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be posting this recording on the Linux Foundation YouTube page and also we'll be sharing Kate's slides on linuxfoundation.org. Hope everyone has a great day and we'll hope you join us again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.